Mr. Head, as we record this, this is June 30th, 1995, the Southern Baptists just this past week passed a resolution that in effect apologized for the social sins of the past, segregation, slavery. You have been a very active member and participant in Southern Baptist affairs. You're still a Southern Baptist. Yes. I have not been as active in Southern Baptist affairs as I have local Baptist affairs. I am still a member of the Southside Baptist Church, have been for 55 years or so, something like that, and I've tried to uh, have some effect on uh, the things that I believe were uh, improper for Christian religious body uh, to be engaged in segregation. Using that word, improper, segregation, slavery, how do you feel about this resolution that's just been passed? Well, uh, it, it wasn't as big a surprise to me as it might have been to some people. Uh, I've been on the board of trustees at Sanford University for 35, 40 years. I was chairman of moving the college from East Lake to Lakeshore Drive, and we had an application shortly after we started building that nice, uh, beautiful campus now uh, from a black woman who wanted to enter the school, and uh, everybody was extremely nervous about it. Uh, and we finally, after much deliberation and several meetings of different uh, groups, executive committee and education, academic committee and so forth, the amazing thing was that the trustees met and a peanut farmer from Enterprise, Alabama, redheaded, freckled face, says, well, does her grades meet the academic qualifications? And they said, yes. He says, then what are we talking about? Why don't you admit her? Now that happened, oh goodness, uh, 40 years ago. But now, with the Southern Baptists 40 years later passing this resolution, uh, it took 40 years for them to pass a resolution, and yet they had such turmoil to admit the first black into Samford. How do you feel about it now? And then we'll go back. Oh, I feel good, but that isn't, uh, that isn't really the answer to your question. The question was that that particular incident of admitting a black girl who later became a, well, I'll identify her. She's now been elected director of the American Red Cross nationally. That's, right. that's the kind of person that uh, we were debating about admitting to Sanford University. It, uh, the point is that we have gradually, gradually, far too slow and too gradually, we've changed. Some people get impatient with change. I do. I'm terribly impatient with change. But I've had to realize that I can't move everyone's conscience at once. I just do the best I can as an ambassador I try to have a little influence here, I try, I, whatever I can do. So the answer to your question is, I think they were very slow, maybe a hundred years slow in the resolution, but I'm grateful that they passed it. And I hope that some of the things that were said by pastors, leaders of the Baptist Southern Convention about what that means for the future will hold true because of a tremendous amount of work yet to be done. For example? Example, housing. We Southern Baptists are the largest Protestant population in the country. And Southern Baptists in Alabama is a 
large percentage of the population of this state. We should see to it that we merge our churches where there is an opportunity to merge churches, black and white, not to eliminate black churches, not to eliminate white churches, but to make it possible to have intercourse of con congregations and exchange of Christian fellowship on a regular basis. Then we should also at the same time see to it about housing. Then at the same time we should see to it about health conditions. Then we should also at the same time see to it that children in school have the finest opportunities to acquire an education so that they can be self-respecting and receive respect from everyone else regardless of the color or station in life and that they have something else to look forward to in this technical age rather than just playing basketball and football and some of the great athletic sports in which they excel. That is not the only opportunity that I want to see. I want to see them take a part in everything that goes on in this country. Mr. Head, you've had a full, rich life that has uh, given you numerous awards here in Birmingham. Oh, I've been blessed. I've been but blessed. You, but you've also been a very courageous man in the environment in which you lived. Now, let me ask you, let's go back to the beginning. Why were you different than some of the people that you worked with? That you, you ran a business, but you weren't afraid to tie up with somebody like A.G. Gadsden. You weren't afraid to bring in a Whitney Young. Why not? Certainly you didn't get applause for that. Well, I learned from my dear mother, who lived to be 103 years old and was born and raised in Pickens County, Alabama, which is one of the poorest counties in the entire United States. She was born and raised on a plantation. Well, she was a typical Southern lady. She loved Lucy or Josephine or any black person that she became personally associated with. She loved them. She thought, and I've heard her say it many times, handed down from the good Lord. But as a group, she hated them. Now what in the heaven's name can cause a thing like that to exist in a human mind? I don't know. It may have been fear. I'm afraid that a great deal of what we've suffered from was just fear. Uh, she lived to be 103. And I worshiped her. She lost her husband when she was young. She had four children. She moved back to Alabama, that's why I'm here, in 1914 with four children under 15 years old and on her own with a little bit of insurance, not much, they didn't have much in those days. And she raised those four children. So I say I'm blessed, okay, but I was subjected or I learned from her how easy it was to be prejudiced. I hate to use the term, but bigotry. I learned at her knee how this could happen in an individual. Love those that she knew and was associated with and came in contact with frequently, loved them. But Hated, uh, that may be too severe. Feared may not be adequate, but somewhere along the line, she was a typical Southern person that wanted to have really nothing to do with those that she wasn't closely associated with. How did you get up to be different? Were your siblings different or just you? Well, I had some early experiences. I had, uh, I had to go to work because of uh, 
the war, uh, took my brothers off to the war, and so I had to go carrying papers and cutting grass. That's fine, it was a great thing for me. I, I met a lot of people that I still know. But I was taking on a new job, 1923, and uh, a couple of years after I started out working, I tried to cross First Avenue and 20th Street at noon one day, and I said, someone said, oh, there's a parade coming. So I stopped. Well, the Ku Klux Klan had a parade that day. They claimed that they had 7,000 people in the parade. I don't doubt it. They also claimed that they had seven judges off of the city and county court benches. I have no way of disputing that. It horrified me because I looked upon the Ku Klux Klan as an alien uh, organization in this country. And it made a tremendous impression on me as a young man that this city could literally stop and watch 7,000 people parade in white sheets and hoods. And they claimed that they had every judge on the bench of the city and county in that parade. Well, as I read history and I read books about Hugo Black and others, it's pretty well confirmed that what they said and that parade was true. And then a little bit later, I remember that uh, the Ku Klux Klan or those who they influenced out in Penson Valley when that was nothing but a dairy farm, all big dairies. And Dr. Dowling, who was the health officer of Jefferson County, was struggling with typhoid fever that was killing babies by the dozens every summer. And he finally said, population, the problem is the milk. Our milk is contaminated. I am going to inspect all the dairy farms. He did. He told them they'd have to clean up the dairy farms. If they were gonna sell milk in this county, he as the health officer would not permit it them operating until they cleaned up the dairy farms. Ms. Hanson, they took him out one night, tied him to a tree, stripped his clothes off, tarred and feathered him, and gave him 24 hours to get out of town. Because he called for cleaner milk? Because he threatened to close their dairies if they didn't clean up their barns. Was the Klan, were the members of the Klan dairy we don't, farmers? We don't know positively that it was members of the Klan. I said, or people that the Klan influenced, because I, I had no proof of that. But that's a fact. Later on, it is a fact that historically, two young men in Eastlake wanted to become members of the Klan. In order to prove that they were deserving of being a member of the Klan, they had to perform some kind of an act that would impress the Klan chapter that they were worthy of being members. So they went out, and the first black man that they saw was a young man. They hit him in the head, they castrated him, and they went back to the Klan headquarters to prove that they were worthy of being a member. Now I want to tell you something, Ms. Hanson. Many young men would be influenced by those kind of episodes in their young life. Why? Well, I think they would consider it inhuman. They would consider it anything but Christian. They would consider it something that they didn't want to be a party of. And I am convinced that a great many rebelled against that but they were afraid to say something about it for fear they'd lose their job. They'd become one of those agitators that was stirring up things or whatever. They were afraid. And that, from that point on, I began to recognize that fear was the real important ingredient that caused people 
to act as they did towards their fellow citizens. Why that happened were, to be different. Why weren't you afraid, Mr. Head? What? I mean, you I'm not sure about that. Were you I'm ever not afraid? sure about that. Uh, I, I've had a lot of people call it courage. You use that term. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe it was that. I believe there's something that uh, I inherited that told me that uh, there are certain things that are wrong that you're not going to have anything to do with, and that if you can prevent it, you must do it. Now, I don't, I don't know whether that is a religious influence. Or I, I, I'm not sure about that. All I know is I'm grateful that I have it. And whoever gave it to me, my mother or the good Lord, I'm very grateful for it. Because I enjoy life. I enjoy people. I haven't missed a meal, Betty. Oh, I've had uh, employers tell their employees, don't bu do business with that fellow. I've had boycotts. Oh, well, uh, I, I want to get off the subject of oh, me. Oh, I do, because this is part of our history. I want to get off the subject of me. Okay, let's talk about the climate. Well, I mean, you are part of that time, Mr. Head. I mean, that's the beauty of it. And, and yes, indeed, you were a man of courage. You might just as well live with that accolade because it's going to hang with you to eternity. But let's talk a little bit about that time that the Klan marched. And, of course, there was rumors that Hugo Black marched with that. I think he even said he did. And you saw it. It changed you. Did the newspapers talk about it? Was there any editorials against it? Who did you find that you could talk to that agreed with you? Well, I think that's a very important point. Uh, Victor Hansen, senior, uh, had no sympathy for any of that kind of doings in the community. And I went to uh, one of my very good friends, and I'm not going to deal with individuals now because I don't want their families uh, to think that I'm criticizing a, a good friend that deceased that was a good friend of mine. But I went to one of these important newspaper people who we consider ourselves for close friends. And I said, look, we can't tolerate this. For heaven's sakes, come out with an editorial change your news copy, do anything that you can to expose to, how, to this population and its readers wherever how horrible you think this is. You know it is. Now, you have an obligation to do that. You know, so, Wait a minute, Jim. You're going to have to quit being idealistic and become realistic. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, we tried something like this a number of years ago when Mr. Victor Hansen was here. We lost 40,000 subscribers in the first two months. And we resolved then we were never going to be a damn fool about that subject again. We are not going to get involved in that. We'll report the incident, but we are not going to editorialize and we're not going to preach to the population and our subscribers as to what they ought to do. Now, that sounds strange now, because that wouldn't happen today. I went to some of my good friends that were in the retail business, and I said, look, this is going to kill this, this city. It's going to kill your business. No, now, wait a minute, Jim, you're off on the wrong foot. We cannot take a part in this. We cannot change what you say we should change about trying on clothes or lunch counters. Even a grand friend of mine that was, again, I'm not going to mention his name. I don't want to embarrass his family. Head of one of the largest department stores. He and I were a golfing buddy. We went off to trips together. He said, Jim, it's true we have a lunch counter and we don't allow blacks to speak there. But he said, look, for heaven's sakes, don't bring this thing up anymore. I value your friendship, but we can't afford to lose 20,000 customers. And that's what would happen. It was fear. I went to another one, same thing. Fear of what they were going to lose. What would happen if they took a stand? And Betty, I want to tell you that if I had any 
gumption or anything, that reinforced it because it began to dawn, became realizing that this thing had became a cancer in the whole community. The ministers, I went to one of them, the most beloved ministers, and I said, uh, Doctor, look, you had one of the most prestigious churches in the state. You have more real estate and everything. In heaven's name, why don't you say something about this ugly thing that is happening in our community that our members want to hear from you? Jim, I don't dare do that. I understand what you're saying, but I don't dare do that. If I do, I'll lose half of our membership. Betty, this may sound ridiculous to you, but it was a fact. That's, the lawyers didn't want to speak out for fear that they would lose clients. They knew what the law was. They knew what was going to happen. They knew that school segregation and all other segregations were absolutely contrary to this country's concept. But they didn't want to be the ones to speak out for fear they'd lose their clients. My question to you is, you, during all this, very outspoken, seeing people working behind the scenes, as well as taking a few public stands, still ran a business. Did you lose clients? I have wondered about that myself, and I've, I've almost taken a poll. Why was this customer loyal to me in spite of that? They didn't have that fear. I didn't lose a single retail department store customer or friend. They lost their business, but I didn't lose their friendship. Finally, most of them died off. I lost them. I did have some boycotts. I did have some handouts on the street. But look, I'm making a mistake, and I don't want to continue this. I want to quit talking about my experiences. I, look, we're, we're beyond that now. I know we are, but this is an oral history, and uh, it's, it's necessary. Let me, I know it makes you uncomfortable, and I, and I won't dwell on all of those things right now, or your role necessarily, but we must understand a little bit the climate in which I first knew you, for example, in Birmingham. How did you get to know A.G. Gadsden, and why? Well, uh, that's an interesting thing because uh, I spoke at their invitation to a group of uh, young black people who were interested in getting Whitney Young to come to Birmingham to help reorganize the Urban League that had been eliminated because uh, certain people threatened to withhold their support from the community chest if the Urban League was uh, a part of it. Uh, so I agreed to meet with them. And one of the young men that I met, uh, I, I'm sorry I can't recall his name, I wish I could. Uh, he was a student, and I've forgotten if it was Miles College or where. And uh, one day after the Korean War, this was in the 50s, he stopped me on 20th Street and he says, Mr. Head, can I speak to you a minute? I said, sure. And I recognized him, and I said, how in the world are you? He said, well, I'm fine. I've been off to Korea. Oh, I'm glad you're back. You look fine. He said, I, I feel good. But he said, let me ask you a question. He said, hey, over in Korea, I was in a company of a bunch of Alabama boys, white and black. We exchanged cigarettes and cups of coffee and everything else in the foxhole. And some of, them, some of us got wounded, some of us got killed, some of us, but we were buddies, real sure enough buddies. And I listened to him standing there on 20th Street and he told me about his experiences for a while. And then he said, but when I get back home, 
I see there's some of those on the street and they don't want to stop and even say hi. They don't want to be seen with me. I said, why? I don't know unless they're just afraid that somebody will see them talking to a nigger. Well, uh, that touched me. I thought, what in the devil? We're sending a boy over to, to fight in Korea. He got along fine with his contemporary soldiers in the foxhole. They swapped and everything. And he comes back home, and they won't even stop long enough to say, hello, how you getting along, buddy, for fear. So I went up to uh, one of the downtown churches. And uh, I went in to talk to the bishop. And the bishop said, uh, Mr. Head, I don't want to get involved. You were asking me if we can hold a meeting in our church to invite some people to come down and discuss this. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to get involved. I was successful, however, in contacting one of his younger rectors and uh, uh, through him, I got permission, he got permission, uh, to use the bishop's study to invite some people for a discussion of what was wrong and what could be done about it. Well, I approached one of the life insurance company executives, and he said, whoop, Jim, I love you, and you and I, you know, are good friends, but our company operates under the laws of the state legislature, and I don't dare. They could put me out of business. I'm not going to get involved. I said, I understand. I'm sorry. I wish you would. I went to others. It's pretty much the same story. Look, Jim, I'm not saying you're wrong, but count me out. I, I just can't. My board my board, now we're talking about his board of directors. My board would say, what's the matter with you? You lost your mind? You getting involved in this thing? So I finally uh, found out that Sid Smyre and his wife, and he was a fellow Rotarian, had gone to Tokyo, Japan for the International Rotary Convention. And he walked out of his hotel that morning, and there was an extra, I don't mean an extra, a paper with headlines being sold on the steps of the hotel. That buses bearing freedom riders had been raided in Birmingham on Mother's Day, and they had been brutally beaten. And beaten. Be yeah, but, and, and the bus was later burned. And that so embarrassed him. So the newspaper story said, because they published that in the Birmingham paper. It embarrassed him. And I heard about it the next Wednesday at the Rotary meeting, that he had been embarrassed in Tokyo by a newspaper. They were blaming the newspaper now. They weren't blaming anybody else, just blaming the newspaper for publishing that, making a big to-do about it, and embarrassing but I knew that he was probably embarrassed, truthfully. And although I knew Sid Smyer was a very powerful state senator and that he was undoubtedly, he was raised out in Eelton, and I, he was undoubtedly a member of the White Citizens Council or... Uh, I was going to say that, yes. Uh, or some organization that say, uh, we'll put up $600 a piece and send them back to Africa, if that's okay. So I called Sid Smyer. I, again, I was trading a little bit unfairly on my affiliation as a fellow Rotarian. I'm surprised they didn't kick me out. Uh, I was going to ask you that. You were ended up being president. But they haven't. Uh, well, they've changed too, Betty. They have. They haven't. Uh, they wouldn't have a, a woman member. Absolutely. Now we have a number of outstanding women. They wouldn't have a, anyone but a white Caucasian male member. Right. Now That's all changed to, now. Okay, go back to trading on, on your... Now to get back to Sid Smart. Right. So I went to Dr. Gaston. I told him what had been going on in the church and that we had these people and we had stories that we could hardly believe. 
Stories like a young black woman, 18 years old or 19, went up to register at the courthouse. And the registrar says, uh, what's your name? Okay. What's your address? Are you married? No. You have any children? An insulting sort of a record asking a person on a voter registration, are you married? No. You have any children? So uh, I told Dr. Gaston about this, and he didn't know that. And he said, well, Jim, uh, I didn't know that. I know an awful lot of things that are bad, but I didn't know about that. I said, did you know that uh, a black man or woman cannot even go up in the upper floors of any of the office buildings in downtown Birmingham to call on their attorney or to pay a payment at the bankruptcy court, which was then up in the Frank Nelson building, or any reason whatsoever. They cannot ride a passenger elevator. They have to wait on the freight elevator. And if the freight elevator is hauling trash or furniture or whatever, they're going to have to wait till it's all done before they can get upstairs. Well, he kind of bristled. He said, yeah, I did know that, but I had forgotten it. I said, if I make an appointment with Sid Smyre, would you go with me? Sure. So I made the appointment. I called him. I said, Sid, I want to come see you. All right? When? I said, you name it. He did. Dr. Gaston and I picked him up. He wouldn't, we wouldn't go in the front door. We went up the alley, went in the back door, because we didn't want to embarrass Sid with any of his friends or customers or employees or anything. We sat down and we told him these things. I reminded him he was embarrassed in Tokyo, and I said, I think, Sid, you might be embarrassed to learn something that I honestly believe you don't know about. And I told him about this. He said, are you telling me the straight dope or are you just putting on a show? You mean that in, they can't ride a elevator except the freight elevator in the Brown Marks building, the Empire building, the Woodard building, the John A. Hand building, the Frank Nelson building? I said, that's correct. And you're the president of the Birmingham Realty Company and you own the Frank Nelson building and maybe some of the others. He wrote it down on a pad. I told him about the restrooms and the drinking fountains at the courthouse, and I said, you are the state senator from this county. It took about 30 or 40 minutes, I guess. He said, give me two days. I said, whatever you want. I said, you were nice enough to see us, thank you. You gave us an opportunity to bring you some, I, I'm afraid. Maybe astonishing. He said, it is. In two days, it had all been wiped out. There's Not no the more. drinking fountains, however. What's that? Not the drinking fountains. Just the elevators, you mean. Just the elevators, the drinking fountains, the restrooms at the county courthouse, and instructions to the people that interviewed people at the voter registration thing. Don't you dare ask any insulting questions of anyone. Mr. Head, how did Sid Smyer, aside from embarrassment, manage the group that got together to meet with King after the marches? Were you part of that group? No. Why? Because Sid Smyer didn't want an activist. That's unfortunately the that was the term that was applied to me by a lot of people. He wanted to talk from his level to his compatriots, of people of like kind who had been fighting this thing. And he wanted to appeal to them on a strictly economic basis that we cannot afford a continuation of this thing. If it does, it's going to get worse. It's going to get cancerous. We're going to be the lacking stock of this country. We, remember now, he's the president of the Birmingham Realty Company. And I'm not saying that he did anything 
from a monetary standpoint alone. I honestly believe, I'm convinced of it, that he had a change of heart. And it may have been in Tokyo, not in Birmingham. But he was committed from that point on to try and persuade businessmen as I had tried to influence him by saying, this is wrong. And it's all going to slap us in the face in business. And if we ever try to get into heaven, it's going to clobber us. Well, I don't know whether he took to that, but uh, <laughs> anyway, he did. in 48 hours, he said, give me two days. And in 48 hours, he delivered, which showed and confirmed the fact that just a few people could run the town and had been running the town for generations. Yes, they used to say, someone said what Birmingham needed was 12 good funerals and maybe we could start over again. Did you hear well, that? Well, it would have to, yes, of course. It would have to be selective. <laughs> but uh, about 12 would be about the right number. 12 people actually controlled this town, how things happened, who got where. Maybe fewer than that, but be generous and say 12. Why didn't they come down on your neck? I mean, you... They did. Tell me about that. Oh, I don't want to get into that. That's too darn personal. That doesn't really have any uh, bearing on anything that's... Uh... But you see, I think, Mr. Head, in doing an oral history of our town, we have to look a little bit at the climate that, that we all were part of, and, and that climate uh, produced change. Look, Betty, Birmingham, remember this now, was a young city. By comparison with Memphis or Nashville or Atlanta or Jacksonville or New Orleans, it was a young, young city. Remember also that it would not have existed except that two railroads crossed, and they wouldn't have crossed except for the fact that we had iron ore, coal, and limestone. Right. The only place on the face of God's green earth where you find the three essentials for manufacturing steel in one spot. Okay, because that happened, who was going to develop that? The farmers of Eelton and up and down the various valleys, well, they, they had no more idea than the man of the moon. They didn't even know that that was red ore. They didn't know that there was coal down there or limestone meant anything. They were interested in crops. So people from elsewhere, Tennessee, Montgomery, Pittsburgh, New York, Chicago, Cleveland, heard about this. And they said, hey, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that there are minerals and all in the south, in the cotton land? And the first thing you know, Birmingham was booming. Booming with what? Those ingredients. Who caused it to boom? People from elsewhere. And what few investors from Tennessee and Montgomery and around the South that put a few dollars, they couldn't sustain the needs. And so they sold out to the big money interests of Pittsburgh, U.S. Steel, so on and so forth all over the country. And look, I'm not begrudging all of that because some of that brought some great blessings. The Ireland's, for an example, they were not natives here. They came from Ohio. And there, you couldn't find finer people. They created Vulcan materials out of nothing. They created uh, Kirkwood on the river. Oh, they, they were generous people. But the curse that we inherited was this. Finally, U.S. Steel was the owner of the principal industrial development. And they had plants in Gary, Indiana, and Pittsburgh, and elsewhere. And they only bought this down here for protection against any competitive thing against their other investments. So they inaugurated Pittsburgh Plus, which meant that 
If you sold steel out of Birmingham to Texas or California or any place, it had to be the price of Pittsburgh plus the freight from Pittsburgh to that destination. And they sent men down here, said, look, go down there, run that mill, and be sure that it makes money. And most of the people that they sent down were only interested in staying here until they retired and could move to California or uh, Martha's Vineyard or Florida or someplace. They had no roots down in the soil. We didn't have any families back in those days that had any deep roots into the soil of this community. Later, we acquired just a few, like Crawford Johnson, who stumbled onto Coca-Cola, made a lot of money, but, and he was originally a Baptist. Uh, he helped save Samford University that was bankrupt. They couldn't pay their faculty salaries. They couldn't buy the coal or run the furnace. They couldn't do anything. He said, I'll bail it out if you will let me get Harwell Davis to uh, be president of the So it was tit for tat. It would... Well, uh, there was one exception to the people that came down here from U.S. Steel, and that was G Gordon Crawford, George Gordon Crawford. He came down and he was horrified. He says, these shanties out here are a disgrace to human beings. So he says, build me some homes. The company owned them. We'll rent them. We'll take them rent out of the paychecks. Build me a commissary. Build me a hospital. And he built Lloyd Nolan Hospital right over the hill there. Build me a school. It's too bad that he couldn't stay here. 65 caught up and he had to move. But he was a great humanitarian as well as a president of Tennessee Coal Iron Railway Company, but he was an exception to the rule. The majority of them, you couldn't remember the names. But they controlled the town. Someone has written about Birmingham that it was a city of overseers, not It was run just like a plantation. They owned a company store. You bought from the company store. They owned the sheriff. There never would have been a Bull Connor except for TCI. You think so? Do what? You really believe that? That well, if it hadn't, that, that they supported Bull, they threw money at him, they got him elected? Well, I'm not the only one that said oh, that. Oh, of course not. I've read it. I just wanted to, on the yeah, record. Of course I believe it. Yeah. Because I ran into it. I was appointed chairman of the victory bond drive for Jefferson County. In the, at the end of the war, 1945. And I went to Bull Connor, who was then city police commissioner at City Hall, and I said, Bull, I've been appointed, so forth. And I said, uh, it's important that we not allow our citizens to squander their savings because they couldn't buy anything. They couldn't buy an automobile, couldn't buy a radio, couldn't buy a radio, couldn't buy a radio, couldn't buy a radio, they have fortunately been forced to save some money. Now, we don't want to make a bunch of monkeys out of ourselves by beating up the price of the first radio that comes along, the first automobile and so forth. We're going to put this into victory bonds, savings. They'll earn interest, better interest, until production gets the price down sensibly. And I said, in order to do that, I've got to put on some kind of a gimmick. And I've come up with an idea that I'm going to have a roll out the barrel. And for everyone that buys a bond, we'll give them a stub. And we put the other stub into the barrel and we roll it down 20th Street. And we'll make a big hoopla every day at noon. And people will know what this is all about. And we'll draw them at the Alabama Theater and blah, 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 blah. He says, uh-huh. <laughs> he says, you know, head, he always called me head. He says, that's raffle. 
and that's against the law. But I'll tell you something. If they put you, if they arrest you, just let me know, because damn sure I'll get you out right quick or I'll get in the jail with you. Now that's, you can say, oh, well, he was trying to be nice to you and he was trying to do something for the war effort, blah, blah, blah. No, what he was doing was showing me that whatever in the hell needed to be done, that he wanted to get done, he didn't have to ask anybody. He just go ahead and do it. There were a lot of people in this town, however, I can remember from my first arrival here, that supported Bull Connor, either privately or publicly, not well, just TCI. That, that isn't any mystery, Betty. They supported him for three reasons. Not because they were proud of him, not because they thought he was a great commissioner or police chief or anything like that. But first, they either worked for TCI or they sold TCI or they sold them insurance or they sold them supplies or they blah, 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 blah. Or some of their relatives worked for TCI and they weren't about to do anything that would cause someone to say, don't do business with that fellow. He's not one of ours. Why did TCI... That's why I say it was a plantation operation. And Bull was the overseer, the sure. one that cracked the whip, sure. that made everything. Okay, tell me about cracking. They, they, could, they could say to Bull, look, buddy, we've got 38,000 employees. You run for commissioner. We guarantee your election. I'm going to prove that to you. Okay. I was state chairman for the uh, Democratic Party for the John Kennedy campaign. Me, a Baptist, finance, not, not the campaign, financial campaign. A Baptist supporting a Catholic candidate for president in the state of Alabama and chairman of the finance committee asking people to put up money. What, what's the matter with you? Have you lost your bearings? No. That didn't enter the picture with the people that appointed me the executive committee of the Democratic Party. Well, sir, I learned something. We raised the largest sum of money in the state of Alabama that's ever been raised for a Democratic candidate for president. In spite of why? Exactly, why? Simply because the personality of that man and what his head to the Baptists and other preachers in a convention meeting in Dallas or Houston, I've forgotten which, about religion and the presidency and this country, plus the fact that this country was ready, youth-wise, returned from the war. And here was a war veteran, youth. Everything fell into place. And the religious prejudice had to take a side and so he carried the state of Alabama. We raised the largest sum of money that's ever been raised in Alabama for a Democratic candidate. And people were behind that. But here's the reason I'll get on that and I'll get off of it right quick. I went up to the inauguration and uh, one of my close friends uh, was running a company that was a tenant of the city of Birmingham. And uh, he and I were close and he and our wives went with us. Go ahead. I'm talking too much. No, you're not. You're exactly what I want you to say. I just had to turn this over, Mr. Head. Whoops. I'm sorry, I can't get it in. <laughs> Go ahead, keep talking, the tape is rolling. So you, you and your wife went up for the, to the inauguration. We went up, we weren't flying back in those days, you know. Right. Went up on the train. Uh, a federal judge was on the train with us. Uh, we stopped in the Sherham Hotel. It snowed, it was a blizzard. And uh, now I'm back on the story. Okay. 
Bo Connor called this friend of mine, who, as I say, was a tenant of the city of Birmingham. In other words, he was renting, well, he rented the Hayes Aircraft hangars, which the city owns. In other words, the city got them from the government for nothing after the war. And he called this friend of mine and said, uh, I want to talk to you. He said, well, okay, Bo, come on up. Uh, Jim Head's here. So uh, I said, I'll get out. No, he said, stay here. Stay here. Bo came in and says, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, one of your employees. What about him? We want to run him for mayor. He said, what are you talking about? He says, uh, we're talking about Art Haynes. He says, Art Haynes is a son of a minister, Methodist minister, and uh, he's a former veteran, and uh, he's been on the FBI, and uh, we want to run him for mayor. And uh, Lou Jeffers says, uh, wait a minute. Uh, he's in charge of our labor relations. I know, we know all about what he does, but we want to run him for mayor. And I have a uh, guarantee that he'll be elected. Now, in my opinion, the guarantee was TCI said, uh, if that's who you want, go get him. We'll guarantee that he'll be elected. After all, they had 38,000 employees. And those employees had friends and customers and bought insurance from people and automobiles from others and groceries from others and all that. So the influence was, it's a plantation operation. Well, we, <laughs> we kind of poo-pooed the idea for about 30 minutes and uh, Bo wouldn't take any poo-pooing at all. He says, look, let's don't waste time. We want him to run for mayor. Well, the conclusion was, oh, okay. Have you talked to him? No, but I want you to talk to him right now. You call him up and tell him that it's okay for us to talk to him about running from there. So he did right then. And you could tell that the fellow on the other side was dumbfounded, surprised, and didn't know anything about it. He said, well, here, let me, t Bull talk to you. So Bull said, it's all set. We're going to run you from there. He did, and he was elected without any problem. I remember when they tried to get rid of that triumvirate very well. I remember when they put up Tom King. Do you That's remember? right. You remember what they did to Tom King? Let's talk about that. Well, I don't... Uh, they sort of... <laughs> I, don't, I hate to use the term, but they uh, brutalized him. Uh, they set him up. They got Tom him King was a, was a good, dependable, deeply religious, deeply concerned citizen and would have made a, a great uh, Mayor. administrator of the city. But that wasn't what they wanted. And it was simple. It was so simple that it could be done in 30 minutes in Washington, D.C. over the telephone line, and that was it. There wasn't anything else to, no, nothing else to it. One minute he was working for a, a company, and the next minute he was candidate for mayor of the city of Birmingham, guaranteed that he'd be elected. Now, how much more do you want in the way of a plantation operation than that? So all of this fit together, didn't it? It, it was to the... Uh what, the segregation issue, uh, the labor strife that took place in the city, the city owned by eight good men, not even good men, it was owned. So, Mr. Head, you were sort of fighting windmills in a way, and yet uh, they named you man of the well, year. Well, I tell you, there's always been something like that. There's always been something like that, Betty. I, I don't want to be quoting paraphrase thing, but honestly, all that is necessary for evil to exist is for some good people just not do a damn thing about it. And evil will take care of it without any trouble, quickly. 
And yet, if the good people, whoever they are, ever decide, look, I've had enough of this. I, I don't sleep well. I, I think about this. It disturbs me. I don't want my children to look back and say, what in the hell did you do about that, daddy or granddaddy? And not be able to say anything about it. So it does eventually change. The only thing is, I don't know why the good Lord puts up with it for so long, waiting for it to change. I really don't understand that. Mr. Head, thank you. Thank you. It's been a wonderful life. You've led a wonderful life. Well, I have. I've been blessed. I said, uh, I, uh, what, what more can an individual uh, want than uh, a fine family and, and uh, good health? And, and now, Betty, I have a world of friends. You know who, unfortunately, unfortunately, most of my good friends that I had back in the 40s and 50s and 30s have passed away. They're no longer here. But let me tell you something. The greatest thing that's ever happened to me is that their sons and daughters who have been off to college have come back, and they are entirely different people. They don't have that fear. They are not going to be handcuffed and shackled by those kind of thoughts and those kind of prejudices. They have learned something differently because they've lived with other people under different circumstances and they don't believe that these things were ever necessary. Maybe that's why the Baptist said, look, we're really apologetic for what's happened. I'm not sure, I don't make any big to do about that. They're gonna to have to demonstrate to satisfy me that they mean exactly what their words, and that's what the pastor who presented the resolution said, that words are not sufficient. It will depend on our actions. Well, I agree. It's, they're going to have to show actions, and I'm sure they will. Thanks, Mr. Head. Congratulations. I am sorry if I've worn you out. You have Sweet and Oh, Lord, it's sweet.